What's going on here? This is a presentation on making finished video games, specifically targeted towards student developers, but I think is applicable to beginning developers in many different environments and of all different ages. So to begin with, a bit about my background. I started making video games about 15 years ago. A lot of them were DOS games based on other games that I liked. I made a Pac-Man clone and a Ack Ack Attack version, my own game of, of Arkanoid. Leapfrog was vaguely based on Qbert. But so I've been doing that for a long time. But since I've taken it a professional route, I worked electronic arts for a little bit, helped start Zip Zap Play, uh, did 200 experimental gameplay projects, run a game development blog, made some iOS games, made some other sort of freeware projects on the web, worked for a World Rights Company, had my work shown at a LA art museum show with the UCLA Game Art Festival, and uh, I'm proud to say made the Forbes 30 under 30 entertainment list. Although the most relevant out of any of these for what I'm really talking about today is really a very particular scale and environment of game creation, which we started through a club that with Kurt Barrington out at Game Creation Society at Carnegie Mellon. In 2004, we were putting out about five games a semester. I also want to confess as part of this talk that I've made art games before, probably will continue to do so on the side, but that that is not what this sort of presentation's about, not what this really club environment's about, and that when I do these things, they're almost exclusively done alone. The, I think they're very personal projects, can be a messier affair to sort of pull in multiple people on, and it's sort of maybe not as good for people's portfolios in terms of exploring skills that it can extrapolate to other games. At Game Creation Society, and mind you again, this was, this was 2004, so freeware development was sort of in a different space than it is now. Most of our games were downloadable PC games, although we had a wide variety. Since then, we've started a similar club out here at Georgia Tech called VG Dev. And in this club, we've put out a number of games. The ones here are, are teams where I've been involved with either level design or art, and a couple of cases, project lead. Because I've spent so many years working on video games, and in particular, video games in student team environments where there's a lot of, where there's a mixture of skill levels and a lot of beginners involved, I want to share what I've seen that I think separated those peers of mine who have succeeded and been able to stay with it successfully from those who have maybe floundered a bit more. First and foremost, you don't want to be this guy, right? There's this there's this sort of notion out there of, of what, what an indie developer is, and I don't think it's good for us. Talking about things like this indie guy meme, uh, it's not cool to bite off more than you can chew. You know, you, you don't want to have pride for how much you can't handle the work that you picked up. Quite the opposite, you want to have pride from having finished things, and that often means biting off any amount that you know you can chew. Because if you're not finishing your games, you're not actually making games, right? You're doing some other activity fundamentally because making games really means that there is an output of it, which is a game. And if you're not reaching that state of it, you are just collecting source code or you're gathering pictures or you're having design and philosophy discussions, which I don't mean to say are terrible, but those are different things than making games. So the main reasons why small project teams die is that they bite off more than they can chew. It's usually a matter of scope issues. At the start of the project, a team will get overly ambitious and have an unrealistic scope. In the middle of a project, they will fail to control scope. They'll have feature creep. They won't know when to stop having more ideas. And at the end of a project, they will be unwilling to cut scope. They won't realize that in order to complete any game, you have to start tying up what you've got and, in many cases, finish with less than you projected from the beginning you would need. These are sort of the areas that small, small teams and newer teams especially struggle with. If we had two different people approach us, and one, we'll call him Person A, says, I'm working on building an aircraft carrier, and it's going to be better than the USS Nimitz, you know, that sounds impressive. But I'm not sure I would really believe that that was going to happen. By comparison to Person B, uh, she comes up to us and says, I made a canoe, it's in my garage, you could check it out. So even though the claims of one person may be more grandiose, may be more impressive, the fact that someone has completed something is really what should make it register to us as to who's the real boat maker in this case. Because person B's floats in water with people in it, whereas person A is just collecting things. Why have so many VGDev and GCS games been so gamey or arcade style? Well, there's a real simple answer to this. It's that arcade style requires a lot less content than console or home PC style does. So, for example, if we look here on Joust on the left from 1982, it's an arcade game. All of the action takes place on one screen. The levels are a matter of which birds show up in what order, with what frequency. There's only a few character types, many of which are actually minor graphical variations on one another. And as a part of that, there's very, very little art, right? There's some platforms, there's some birds, the animations only have a few frames. Now, if we compare that to Zelda, and you know, this is SNES Zelda I put up there, but Zelda of any era on any platform this still applies to, they have large worlds, the levels are hand-placed in terms of each element there has to be put there by someone who's consciously designing that space. There are tons of characters 
uh, and think about this, that not just a huge variety of them, but a huge variety of them that behave differently, fight differently, have different strengths and weaknesses, and especially even bosses. The uniqueness of a boss fight can invite a whole extra pile of work. And there are literally, in these cases, years to make the art for those games, from dedicated specialists who know how to stick to one art style for that long, which as amateurs, it's, it's hard for us to sustain even a consistent art style through the length of one short game, let alone years at a time. And with that idea, right, comes this notion that how much work there is to do on a project is an active choice on your part, because it's up to you what games you want to work on. So within VGDev, we have a structure where a project lead pitches the game to the group, and then people in the group can volunteer if they want to get involved with it. But that means that everyone on the team have made the choice that this is a genre, this is a style, this is a scope that they are willing to embrace. This is not like a work environment where through their boss, when they hand you a certain amount of work or a spec to fill out, and you might gripe around, oh, you know, I don't have enough time in the schedule to do this. Here, it's up to each person to decide how much is the amount of work that they want to take on, and no one else can force any more on them. Genre choice plays a big role in this, so rather than just thinking of it as arcade style, vehicles were really common in old games, for reasons why they're still good for us to use, that jeeps and helicopters and spaceships just sort of slide around and rotate, as opposed to animated human bodies, which, unless they are very, very low resolution, require a great degree of skill and talent to animate and to illustrate very competently. I'll point out here that Alice in Bomberland had only a single animated character in it, but it probably took about half of our development time from our extremely capable and talented animator, uh, David, to put that animation together while the whole rest of the art in the game was really sort of just flying out, and just in terms of how long it takes to do a good animated human body. Lazy environments, uh, you can make choices to have your game take place in space, in the ocean, in the sky, or in snowy fields. These are ways to avoid the art challenges of having to decorate the space like you would in an interior area, like houses. These are ways to avoid pathfinding complications, because your AI doesn't have obstacles to go around, or if it does, it might just be a few little sort of isolated snowy trees, in which case then it's a lot easier to sort of brute force your way past. And extra nice is if you can come up with a game where the difference between one level and the next is a matter of number tuning, how fast the shapes fall, how many enemies appear, how frequently uh, enemies attack, or something like that, as opposed to having hand-placed layouts. Now, there's there's a certain craft to having hand-placed layouts that's worth exploring, but I will offer that it is a more advanced type of development to partake in, maybe after you've experimented a bit more with these games where tuning is the difference between one level and the next. An approach for this that I have advocated for a long time, uh, and I've been a big believer in and, and sort of taken shape in my own work, has been to use what I call a decades progression. And that means that until you feel comfortable, like you have explored uh, your abilities in the 1970s complexity of a sort of a Space Invader style, Asteroid style of game, you know, I'm not saying exact clones of these games, although there's value in that exercise too, but really to take off from them an, an overhead space game or overhead shooter of some sort, introduce to you problems that are fundamental to how we think about this space that can really help you when you get to the 1980s complexity with games of a Pac-Man style, a maze-based game, Rampage or Frogger or, or Super Mario Brothers, or, or even just Mario Brothers as illustrated here, uh, to really try to tackle those before you start going headfirst into where a lot of people's minds start, that is 1990s games like F-Zero, Super Mario World. And this comes with a big disclaimer that even by mid-80s, arcade can get pretty tricky and pretty involved. The amount of art that was there the amount of level design that was there. It's, it's, it's one thing to look at a game like Rampage or a game like Paperboy and be able to understand how each part works versus the, the real complexity comes from having to pull together this huge pile of sort of unique data structures for the types of levels that are going on here, tuning of getting them all to be right and the sheer number of spaces that they have to work in. I will warn again, so part of the decade's progression isn't just to say, you know, think about the 70s and start in the 80s, it's to take seriously that mid-80s games, at least at an arcade level, really get pretty tricky to do when you don't have a budget, when you don't have a huge team to work with. It's important to have a good foundation when you're starting your project, because your first decision will subsequently make many others. It's important in that note to use a library. So when I started doing those games in 1997 or so, I was copying assembly code out of the back of books to plot pixels and change the screen resolution and so on. At the time, that's just what I had to do. But you don't want to have to be reinventing code to do those sort of things anymore, there are far, far better ways with optimized libraries, whether we're talking DirectX or whether we're talking about OpenGL, usually in combination with SDL for input and audio and so on, or you, even things like SFML or Allegro, where they are notice, where they're certainly not the same caliber as OpenGL or DirectX, 
but the trade-off there is you can get so much done in less time, or likewise X and A kind of fits in that spectrum of sort of being a simpler DirectX. So you don't want to have to figure out for your own how to parse an image format or audio format. You want the library that you pick and import to do that for you. Engine use can mess up your game, and this is something that new developers especially can get caught up on. They'll think that because they have found either an open source engine or an old commercial engine with a good tool set and community and tutorials for modding, that their game is most of the way done because they already have the graphics engine, the pipeline, and the sound and tools and so on. But the reality is the expectations that this sets for the player in terms of complexity, in terms of quality and production value, are so much higher. I, th you know, I think I'd read a long time ago in a Doom 3 creation book that the amount of time it took them to properly decorate a single room in Doom 3, including you know, texturing and modeling and so on, was really the amount of time it would take them to do an entire level in old Doom games. Be wary of this idea that oh, an engine will help save you a bunch of work. It can really invite a lot of work into what you're doing if you're not careful. But, you know, so like I say, no, no engine, but use a library. Here are again some of those examples. I, Flixel fits in there too. Unity is kind of the exception to the rule. It's sort of a, it's, it's a really strange complement library tool chain platform that's so very much worth investigating at this point. Flash and ActionScript 3 are inherently part engine. Uh, and they are quirky to work with, but they are so much easier to distribute that it is worth taking seriously still as a platform. You make a game that has to be downloaded and installed and configured, meet system specs, and then you can play it full screen while you close everything else, after which you have to uninstall and yada yada. There it is such a higher barrier to entry that you've got to fight a lot to get people to download that and play that, as opposed to if it's a web playable game where someone can go to a URL in, in pretty much any browser on pretty much any OS and play that game, and then leave that URL, and it's like it never happened without any installation or configuration, you can get thousands of plays trivially, and in some cases, many, many more than that, through the virality that comes from that low barrier to entry for those game styles. In terms of programming languages, and th these are my recommendations, not 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 total rules. Um, you're going to hear different things from different people, depending on who you talk to. These are functional my own experience and things that I've witnessed. I will say, I will recommend to only use Java if you are making an Android game, uh, in which case you kind of have to use Java. Minecraft and RuneScape are the weird exceptions, but for the most part, when we see a game develop in Java, it either winds up being performance-bound in a way that it just can't do what we expect to do for, for those kind of games. They're a pain to distribute. More often than not, when I see a game made in Java, it doesn't wind up nearly as well as a game made in, in pretty much any language for, for, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, C++ with either SFML, Allegro, or, or SDL, if you want to make a high-performance game with fancy graphics tricks in it. ActionScript 3 compiled by MXML uh, into a Flash or Swift. Uh, once again, that makes the game more accessible to a lot of people. And I want to stress here, that can be done without buying Adobe Flash CS. And I don't mean to pirate it. I mean that I've got tutorials on what you can do to compile it command line, debug it command line for ActionScript 3 games without ever opening the Adobe Animation Software Suite. C Sharp and JavaScript are the languages of choice for Unity if you're willing to deal with 3D. Although the warning there is that people sometimes get the wrong idea that the hard part of Unity will be the 3D programming the hard part of Unity is really the art issue of coming up with a style and a pipeline and the kind of time and skill you need of an artist to really populate a world to the expectations of a 3D, 3D game. Language basically needs to be one of three things, right? It needs to be either high performance, and that's your C++ category, or trivial to distribute, and that's your ActionScript 3 slash Flash, or very, very fast to develop with. And I don't even list those here because they, they tend to not result in finished games. But that's where maybe if you're working something like the Love Framework or some other sort of uh, rapid prototyping platform like Processing, there's still value to it. But of course, the trade-off is you don't have the high performance, you don't have the trivial distribution. If it's none of those three, it's probably a bad choice for games. But planning is always tentative, but it does make a huge difference. And you should definitely plan what you got ahead, even though, like I say, it's going to change. I like to ask developers, what would, what would it take to make a demo or light version, a proof of concept, if you will? And design around that as being the full quantity in the final game. Right, so instead of 12 fighters, maybe you only need three. Instead of, instead of a garage full of cars, maybe one car is really all the player needs to prove the concept of your game. And what that lets you do is it lets you test the waters, both among your team and the outside world, to figure out, are you really in love with this concept and the way that it comes together on a machine, the way that it plays when it's all said and done? Because if people love it, you will certainly have an extra chance, if you'd like to make a sequel, to cram in all that extra stuff. On the other hand... If it comes out and it just kind of didn't pan out the way you hoped it did, you've minimized the amount of your own time and your own life energy and that of people on your team that you have shoveled into this thing, which, you know, no one could know before it was done, but just didn't really fit together the way you were hoping.
No one reads a 25-page design document. I've worked with professionals, uh, professional designers who are paid pretty well to read very long design documents who clearly were not reading the design documents. Or the opposite was they sort of treated their whole job like maintaining this documentation as opposed to designing the game. So what I recommend, especially for smaller teams, is to think instead in terms of one screenshot mock-up uh, just showing kind of what are the elements on the display in terms of what information's surface to the player, what scale are things on the screen, what does the basic level structure look like, complementing that with a one-page, two-sided document that sort of highlights some important features about the game uh, that you feel like maybe don't come through on the screenshot and are important to making the game what it is. This one here is the final game that resulted from that previous screenshot. I'll flip back and forth for a second. This was the initial screenshot that we generated. And even though we changed a whole bunch of representational things, we've got better special effects, we have a better interface along the top, we've come up with different building concepts throughout the project, it still worked out very successfully in getting people around the same vision early on with very minimal investment on my part as project lead. And that was Saturn Storm. This is the sequel Eternal Storm. This is the screenshot that I put together when planning the game. And you see I've got sort of some ships attacking, you see there's a shield around the player and there's some lock-on missile things. I've got a radar box and a status for health. And for the finished game, I was actually able to rip art straight out of my concept art and use that for those platforms and pipes. We've got radar in the same place, health in the same place. We added some money, currency to the system, and some radar display and so on. But it's very much, once again, a case of this helped show very concrete thinking in a way that just words, many words on a page would not have been so explicit about how is this supposed to fit together? You know, what's the, what's the vision that we're working towards? This was Battleship 88. This was actually a triage or salvage project where someone else was leading a team and they had a modeler make some, some battleships, but then they, the, the sort of project lead faded off. And so we had these battleships needed to make a game with it, so we had about five weeks left. I just laid them out like this and said, you know, we've got like a throttle, we've got like a radar, we've got how many, let's say every 20 enemy planes you shoot down, you'll get a U.S. Air Force squadron helping you out. Uh, we're going to have the ship take damage based on which part of the hull gets, da gets shot. And all these things carried their way into Battleship 88, where sort of the earliest phase of development for this was basically taking that screenshot and trying to bring it to life. And this was probably my most successful game before I started doing web playable games. This was the design document for Battleship 88, which once again was, was a triage project. But you can see there, all we have listed are, is the storyline, which, you know, who are we kidding? The story is basically, it's World War II, there's boats that fight, and there's only one American boat, and that's you. Features, basically a bulleted list of here are the things that either set this game apart or seem important to the core that we that we don't forget that we had intended to do from the beginning. Art needed was very high level in groups, uh, what types of ships, what sort of background material. And again, that's the ocean there is used as a, as a low content environment where we didn't have to have all kinds of trees and paths and concrete and bridges and whatever. Sound effects needed, this list certainly changed. We had Joe File doing some great sound for the game, but that was the initial list was just to show that as an order of magnitude, it's not an insane amount of sound needed. And then the schedule, just a week by week, what had to happen by each Friday for this game to be done on time, and we, we pretty well kept to that. Speaking of scheduling, so it's shown here as a Gantt chart, which is completely overkill for a small team. I'm just using that to illustrate the idea of scheduling. But basically, you want to expect one coherent contribution from each member weekly. If you're not getting one coherent contribution from a given member weekly, you are probably... Uh, you and they don't have enough going on there in that relationship with the team and the project for it to really make sense for them to linger around and stay in the credits. Unless, you know, there's certain roles of work where it can kind of all happen at the beginning or all at the end. If they're making music or sound effects or something, that's sort of a different story. But if they're a core part of the team, they kind of should be somehow finding a way to do something constructive and coherent each each week. And, and why I keep using the word coherent is because you never want this instruction to be do some more art. This week, you know, Tim will have more code for us um, or keep working on the code. Those aren't useful at all. You want to be able to point to a feature and say, can this be working by the next time we meet? And then, you know, you all expect it to work by then. And, and if it doesn't and, and things happen because making video games is a complex thing to do, that that's still learning, that's still forward progress, that was still undertaken in earnest, and you can somehow pivot from that information towards a more uh, fruitful path. I like to use spreadsheets where for the rows of the spreadsheet along the left side, I'll have um, categories like art, programming, de uh, design or level design, production decisions, maybe relating to scheduling. And then along the top, just 
the the weekly meeting date for Fridays for the you know in this case the semester that we give ourselves or whatever time frame we define for the project. So you have this grid of week by week what has to happen from the programming in order to facilitate getting the sound where it needs to go and getting the art uh, so it's ready by the time the level design needs it and so on. And I just find that to be a, a, a pretty suitable method for, especially, like I say, small teams. Each week, it is on the project lead and the developer to figure out, to get together and figure out what is that task, that coherent task that's going to happen for the week. So that's a shared responsibility. And you do want to keep people engaged, right? Because we're not paying people in these freeware teams. Their payment really is that they get to do something that they're enjoying doing. They get to practice a skill that they want to get better at. And they get to strengthen their portfolio by showing off what it is that they are passionate about. And so really everyone wins if you can find a way to keep someone not just full of busy work, but steering towards what it is that they want to do as best you can. Team size. So Mythical Man Month by Frederick Brooks is just about this idea that how many man hours does this task take isn't really the right way to measure programming, especially this. there's this broken idea of if you bring in programmers on the end of a team, people used to think that would, that would speed you up, sort of like bringing more people for a construction site. But the danger there is actually you introduce all kinds of communication needs and documentation challenges um, disagreements and so on, conflicting conventions. What it all amounts to, at least for our level as students making games or, or, or freeware teams making games, is that programming on a team is a higher order skill than programming alone. It is a fundamentally harder task to write the same code that does the same things in a way that is properly documented and readable by others and adhering to certain specifications or higher levels of architecture that, that have been decided uh, by someone else on a team. And because of this, one student programmer can frequently be faster than three. If you have three, you've got a lot of stepping on each other's toes. You've got some things falling through the cracks. If you have one person, then you that person knows what is and isn't done and can sort of keep on top of it a little easier. Now, you don't want to get stuck on details. Making games is a lot of decisions. In some cases, especially people new to making games, will find that the sheer number of decisions to make is, is every bit as much a challenge as making the art or making the sound. Those decisions are fundamentally game design is all about. I want to point out as part of the, making these decisions that making a great or successful game is partly a matter of luck, right? There, there really will never be an exact formula to it. At best, you could be trying to knock off what worked for somebody else or recently. Even still, most of those clones aren't going to get anywhere near the kind of attention as the original. So making a great or successful game is partly a matter of luck out of your hands. You can do the best you can. Whether or not the public's going to like it could vary one day to the next. That's, that's life. But making a finished game, making a game that is complete and ready for the outside world to play, that is completely in your control and your control alone. No one else can decide that you can't finish this game, especially, I mean, if it's not funded, they can't pull the funding out from under you, you aren't being paid anyway. New ideas will always come up during development, oftentimes through a, through a coding accident or through a sort of design brainstorm or through a um, prototyping session or somehow or another. New ideas will happen as you're making a game, and sometimes you want to pivot towards those. But the easiest pruning metric to apply, I think, is to ask, does this eliminate previously scheduled undone work? I.e., will this free us up with more time to focus on other things about the game? And if so, then I think that's a great idea. If instead it adds new work to a game already in development, or if it wastes finished work that people on the team have already made, but you're going to you're gonna have to chuck it, um, save it for the sequel. Don't be afraid to put that down as, as some other direction to explore. And this is partly also for fairness to people on the team. They signed up with a certain expectation of how long this would take, how much work would be involved, and also kind of partly what sort of game that they're working on because it's one they want to they be affiliated with. And you don't want to change that up on them. Save it for, for a later game. A Burden's Ass is a philosopher's concept for, from a French guy named Burden. Ass here refers to a donkey, as illustrated here. And the parable is that there's this donkey who's very hungry. So he walks into a barn and he sees two equally, two equally appetizing big piles of hay. And so this donkey thinks to himself, you know, this, 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 Hay on the left looks pretty delicious. Maybe I should, maybe I should munch on that. But, but this this bale of hay on the right is also pretty delicious, and and they're kind of roughly the same size, and they both look kind of equal quality. And out of indecision, the donkey starves to death, standing there in front of twice as much food as he actually needs. And of course, it's simply about the notion of indecision, and the dangers that can come from it. Throughout game making, you will be confronted with thousands of decisions, each of which have, in many cases, at least uh, uh, virtually speaking thousands of possible answers, or infinite in some cases. And of those, you don't want to get stuck trying to figure out what is the absolute perfect best right answer. You want to run with it and roll with it. Um, you don't just stand there and starve in front of twice as many good options as you need. You need to just take one and go 
because you've got so many other decisions to make and so much other work to do on this game. Don't get bogged down in those details and those those forks in the path. You want to cut scope aggressively throughout. So you so typically when planning your games, you want to leave lots of wiggle room, plan them modularly. So if someone leaves the team, if time becomes an issue for folks as, as, as their lives change, um, you can still produce a game and not be locked into, uh-oh, we have to do this other stuff or it, it can't be finished. And so cutting scope aggressively throughout isn't just about um, getting the game done, though. In many cases, it actually can produce a better game because you wind up focusing on what was really working most about it, which up until you were implementing it, it was kind of hard to tell from just thinking about it or seeing it on paper. Bang for your buck trade-offs are always an integral part of that scope cutting. Uh, you want to put your effort where it's going to show. There's an old sort of 90-10 rule in design of 90% of the player or the user's enjoyment or attention gets focused on. It's really 10% of the work that got done by the development staff. Uh, and so you want to be trying to figure out what's going to make the biggest splash for the amount of work you have left to do, that you can afford to put into the project. You've got to prioritize it, uh, issues. Uh, there's a perfectionist sort of notion that you want your game to be completely bug-free and flawless in every way. In reality, it is far better to ship, to use the industry term, uh, with minor bugs unaddressed than it is to, to to not ship at all. To have a game which never gets finished because you're you're not fixing you know the glaring issues because you're getting sort of eaten alive by the little things that are really maybe not that important or noticeable to folks. And if you're near the end of the project, if you're running out of time, hack the heck out of it until you're past the finish line. A lot of source code and a lot of old games and a lot of commercial games still uh, is actually kind of a tangled rat's nest or, or a pile of spaghetti um, by the time it's done. You know, that's not the way it looks maybe in the middle. That's certainly not the way you want it near the end. Uh, but if that's what it allows the game to exist and happen, that's often worthwhile. And especially in these cases where it's not something which is likely to be code base directly iterated on for a long time, as say a commercial project might. If this is something where you're making it and you're going to tie it off and you're going to throw it out there, don't be afraid to hack a bit at the end to, to throw in some statics and globals and whatever it takes to, to get it done quickly. I'm a big fan of John Carmack's quote here, if you are willing to restrict the flexibility of your approach, you can almost always do something better. That is the type of thinking which allowed Doom to exist at an era when nobody else could pull off that style of game. And this has to do with, to me also, in terms of the bang for your buck and scope cutting near the end of a project, that the closer you are to the end of a game, the more certain you are about what the game isn't isn't doing. The more aware you are of what constraints you can assume because they've already been imposed on the rest of the game or because they've already been respected by the rest of the game. And there's ways you can try to pivot around that to get the game out faster or better. So actually, one more note on this, that uh, this idea of getting things done faster or cutting things out of it is not just about getting the game done faster. Uh, it's about leaving more wiggle room to polish and tune uh, and focus on the parts of it that are working well. Right, so it's just like a higher performance optimization isn't just because you want to have an insane frame rate, it's because that frees you up to use those resources for other things like artificial intelligence or other special effects that otherwise would be out of reach if you couldn't do those sort of performance gains. All right, and this last point is that a Lamborghini is not a polished Yugo, that you cannot simply take something which structurally from the foundations is, is ultimately destined to be a mediocre result uh, and then sort of tune it and polish it until it becomes this thing which is, which is just a, a monster of a machine. Uh, that, that, that's not how design and engineering work and games ultimately are, are or, or art for that matter, but games are largely involving great deals of design and engineering. So the same sort of metaphor I think is useful to think about. I've seen teams where they are uh, working on a game, this is another one of those symptoms of Java, where they were putting together a game, implementing it in Java, and performance-wise, after the end of their first semester, it just wasn't where they wanted it to be. They didn't understand was that was that ceiling was dictated by their, their choice of implementation platform. They spent then several more semesters going back and throwing themselves against it, but, you know, low, by the time they were finally done with it, it was basically the same game they started with, but meanwhile, they didn't have anything to show in terms of a diverse portfolio of other games they could have made in that time. So wrap it up, learn from it, be willing to sort of accept that this one just didn't work out. Um, be thankful that it's freeware, so you weren't counting on it to pay your bills. Lamborghini is not a polished Yugo. If you got questions, hit me up through email or on the site, of course, chrisdeleon, hobbygamedev at gmail.com or hobbygamedev.com. Thanks for tuning in.